Our guest this morning is Representative Alex Mooney. Good morning, Alex. How are you? Hey, Rob. Good morning, man. I'm good. You're good. Great to have you. I think we've covered this before, but if I'm if I'm correct, in your first election, one of Matt Miller's sons volunteered on your campaign, if I remember this correctly. Matt, yes, is that right? I think you're right. Yes. Thank you, Matt. You've uh, raised some good, good children. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, Joel yeah. Joel was a part of that. Yeah, and, uh, yeah I remember him. Yeah, caught yeah. the attention of, of your mom. So, yeah. That's I think right. I've seen him around since then, too. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah. I learned your your mom's actual formal name, Alex, because I think something happened with her regular email address. Then I started getting emails from a totally different name that I didn't recognize at first. And, and then your mom said, you know, my, my yeah. something with my email, I, I have a new address, so don't be concerned. It's still me. <laughs> Can you pronounce it? Uh, it looked like it was Eulalia. Close. Yes. That was very, very close. I mean, if you pronounce it in Spanish, Eulalia. Eulalia. They pronounce the syllable, you know, they pronounce the syllables a little different. Oh, that's right. Um, the yep. vowel's a little different. But yes, good job. Eulalia, which I, is why she goes by Lala, because no one really wants to say Eulalia. <laughs> it's the same reason why I don't use my real last name on the radio. I use my confirmation name. Mario is a lot easier than Los Cicero. <laughs> it's, oh, it's, my it's, goodness. It's a, it's a well, lot yeah, of exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, let, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit, Alex. Uh, first and foremost, uh, uh, this broke, of course, last night. We had another shooting at a yeah. school. And uh, it used to be when we heard these things, we were... It stopped the day. We were horrified. Unfortunately, now they're so common that it just becomes like another news story, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, what can we do to at least slow these down? I, mean, I don't think you can ever stop people who are willing to die for what they want to do from doing what they're going to do. But what can we do to at least put the brakes on this a little bit? I mean, yeah, of course, uh, prayers to everyone, everyone involved with that and, and those who lost their lives. Um, I mean, there's a lot of talk about school safety, and, and I'm, I'm still getting the official details out. I, I read in a news report, doesn't mean it's true, but it could be that, that this individual shot the door open. Um, so the doors were at least, you know, closed and locked, unlike in some cases yeah. people go through open doors. And that part is true. They shot through the glass windows of the, do of the doors. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, so there's, 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 there's school safety issues. I mean, I'd have to look at this individual's background, see if there had been any other violent uh, acts in the past. I think sometimes you find with people who uh, commit murder that in the past they've committed, you know, assault and battery and attempted murder and other things in the background that have been violent, but not been charged. And, uh, and, and this happens all the time, you know, in big cities and things where they, they let people get away with lesser crimes like loitering and trespassing and attempted robbery and things. They don't, they don't even prosecute them. They let them go. And then next thing you know, the person uh, is, is killing people or doing something worse. So I'm of the view that, that we have enough laws on the books that we just need to enforce the existing laws. And again, that, you know, that, that'll, you know, that'll come out. I mean, um, you know, so, I mean, obviously the Second Amendment needs to be protected in, in all cases because people who are armed can defend themselves before the police get there. And if they're armed, they can defend themselves right away and stop a shooter like that. So I don't know what the school policy is on, on allowing teachers to be armed and things, but um, uh, you know, those would be my thoughts. It's, a, it's something we have to get a, a handle on in this country because it's, it's now the number one killer of children. I just heard a report about that in this country, which is... Uh, number mm -hmm. one? That's what the, some report that I heard on one of the news things. It's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, heartbreaking. Uh, let's talk about your uh, campaign for Senate before we get into some other things here, uh, Alex. And uh, right now, of course, Governor Justice has not officially declared for uh, that seat you have. You got out early ahead of everybody on on that one. Uh, but he's considered to be your main opponent on this. And any thoughts on how this will shape up as as uh, things get closer to Election Day? You know, what I like to say is, is I'll just run on my conservative record, as I've done in the past, I've been mis I've been underestimated uh, a number of times throughout uh, my career. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never lost a Republican primary. Uh, you 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 covered ov obviously very closely the race last year against David McKinley. Uh, a lot of people predicted I would lose that race. I won by 19 percentage points, and I focused on my record. I mean, the I actually think the voters should just you know look at the person's actual voting record and forget all the personal attacks. What I find what happens to me is people don't want to talk about my record, you know, 100% pro-life voting record, um, never voted to raise taxes, you know, uh, you know, strong on freedom, a member of the Freedom Caucus. So rather than talk about my conservative record and my positions, 
that fit well with the voters of West Virginia, what I find, Rob, is they just attack me personally. You know, they just call me names. And I'm not going to repeat the names they call me, and you, you can turn on the ads and see them all yourself. Um, I think it's a disservice to the voters. I actually think in this last race against Mr. McKinley, out, out here where people i have been their congressman now for nine years, um, that they know my record, and they think they know, you know, they believe, they believe that they're, you know, they know who I am, and, and they do. I think the attacks actually boomeranged. I think it actually hurt the person that went so nasty and so personal. So I want to submit my record to the voters. I do I, until someone announces. I know you mentioned Governor Justice, and I know he's thinking about it. I presume other people are thinking about it still too. I presume it's hard for me to, you know, contrast someone who hasn't announced yet. I know he's announced he's thinking about it. So. If he runs, he has a record, too, and I, I'm happily going to contrast our records. You endorsed Treasurer Riley Moore, who mm-hmm. is seeking your seat. Can you tell us why you endorsed him rather quickly? Well, sure. Uh, he is a good conservative. In my first race in 2014, Riley was one of my earliest supporters, even in my primary. And so uh, I felt there was, uh, you know, I say, you know, say you owed somebody, but, like, I felt – you know, since he supported me even in my Republican primary, which was a hard-fought one in 2014, several other people running who were establishment folks and, you know, had support. But Riley came in and supported me early on, even before my primary, and has been a great supporter of mine ever since. Uh, he, he's a friend, and he's a good conservative, um, and I think he, he's, he's well-placed to, to hold this seat. There are other people who might have wanted to run who would not be conservative, in my view. Um, you know, there's folks who've run before, for example, um, that are that I, I would think would be uh, not good down here, even though they might have a Republican after their name. Uh, my, I fear some folks would come down here and vote with Democrats most of the time and vote liberal. Riley's a conservative, so, you know, I was proud to endorse him. He asked. You know, there's something to be said for that, too, you know, Rob, somebody asking. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, they, a, lot of, a lot of folks run for different things. They say, why don't you endorse him? Well, they never asked, you know. So, so Riley asked, and... And, of course, he endorsed me as well for my race for the U.S. Senate, so we can run as, run as a team, which I look forward to doing. One of the big criticisms about you, Alex, from your detractors is that you're never in your district. You're not seen by the people who uh, are supposed to vote for you. Can you address that? I know you've addressed it before in this program, but it is an accusation that keeps recurring. Yeah, that falls right into the category of when people don't want to talk about the issues, they resort to personal attacks. And that, I would consider that a personal attack. So let me just tell you, I live in Jefferson County with my wife and three children. And, um, and my, my daughter, my, la- my last child, my daughter, we call her my bonus baby, was born in Charleston, West Virginia. So uh, I'm around a lot. Um, I've, I have, a, you know, I have 20, uh, 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 27 counties I represent, and I travel them as uh, frequently as possible um, while also spending the appropriate amount of time with my family. And I'm proud of the representation I've provided. Um, you know, so it's it's hard to address a nebulous, vague uh, attack like that. Uh, I think it's petty that people say that and not true. And um, so now uh, people also understand, you know, actually, right now, as I'm talking to you right now, literally right now, I'm looking out the window in my Rayburn House office building. I can see the U.S. Capitol just over the, bu- over the building. The cherry blossoms are in full bloom. So if anyone wants to come down uh, to D.C., the Capitol is open. Since Republicans have taken over, the U.S. Capitol is fully open for tours and meetings. I have a packed day of meetings. I've got mayors from five different towns here in D.C. today that I'm meeting with and many other meetings. Um, so it's beautiful. Capital beautiful. Come on down. But the, the, the schedule of, of someone in my position, a congressman, is uh, we vote four days a week, generally three weeks out of four. Uh, so I have to be uh, in the U.S. Capitol voting on behalf of my constituents. And so, for example, there's a meeting I was invited to on Wednesday. I believe it's out in Buckhannon. Like, literally Wednesday while I'm voting you know, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, so I will be in D.C. voting. I won't be at that meeting on Wednesday. Um, but I do my job. I do it well. And, uh, and I, re- I think I represent the people well. All right. Well, don't be surprised if the three of us show up knocking on your door asking for a tour sometime in the near You're future. You're invited. Yeah, I mean, I, I encourage it. One of the things I do for tours, and it's starting to, starting to hear it a lot from constituents, is to take people up to the gallery and let them watch us vote. You learn a lot by sitting there with your own eyes watching the voting process occur. And, and how the congressmen on the floor intermingle and, you know, how, you know, when the vote's called to end and things like that. So I invite you to do that. John Gilstrap. Good morning, Congressman. I got a Good question. Morning. Let's let's talk some policy here um, with with the majority now. Right. You've, the, the House, you got this 
narrow two-year slice of time is guaranteed to be in, in the majority. And, and what's sucking up all the national news are the talks about investigating committees on um, Hunter Biden and the weaponization of government and and the origins of COVID and, and all of that that's, that's taking up all the, the news space that certainly that I end up being exposed to. What are the big plans this year with the Republican majority to fix things, not investigate stuff that has already happened, but actually put in policies that's going to make life better for us? Well, you know, that's a great question. I hear that one all the time. People do want not just the investigations. They want to see some results, like if Dr. Fauci withheld, withheld information or didn't tell the truth or something like that or is conflicted. I mean, people want to see him held accountable. And now what Congress can do when they're done investigating is, is refer it to the Department of Justice for a prosecution. And Republicans don't control the Department of Justice. It's, you know, the president appoints the, the head of that. Attorney General, Attorney General of the United States, but for an, any kind of enforcement, that, that would occur there. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something I've been saying the whole time, and I'll be saying it as long as I'm in, in office in Congress. I'll be saying this, that the power of the purse, the funding mechanisms of your taxpayer dollars, your listeners who pay taxes to fund this country, uh, deserve to have those taxes used appropriately. And when you have rogue organizations like the FBI raiding Mar-a-Lago, you know, um, we should make sure that the funds that we give them are, are not being abused by political people who want to, who want to politicize what they're doing. Uh, I, I do think, and, and you guys, you all know, my mother fled Cuba when she was 19, and people there, the, the way the communists do things, they accuse you, you have to prove yourself innocent. I'm seeing more of that down here these days. People, be, you know, the, the Democrats and the January 6th commissions and, the, and their hatred of Trump, is, it just blinds them, and they start abusing their powers. And, and look, and this is a nonpartisan comment. Your government should not uh, persecute you. Your government should be held accountable. And, and the way we've always done that, when you have agencies going rogue, is we take their money away. We simply don't appropriate money that they're abusing. I experienced this on the war on coal, when the Department of Interior, my first two years, uh, would fund what was called the stream buffer zone, where you couldn't mine coal within 100 feet of a trickle of water, which was outside of their, their powers. They did not have the power to do that. We should have just taken their money away. No money can go to enforce that rule. That traditionally is how to back and force back and forth, the balance of powers between the two chambers existed. And so now we are back in charge, as you just said. Look, it was only five votes. I tell this to people. We won, we won by five votes. I never thought we'd pick up 40 seats. We thought we'd pick up the U.S. Senate. We did not pick up the U.S. Senate. We didn't pick up 40 seats. But we did win. Nancy Pelosi is not Speaker of the House. The voters of this country, the voters, gave us a Republican majority. So I believe, just like my good friend Jim Jordan, we should do what we said we would do on the campaign. Not that simple. Do what we said we would do. Um, I mean, not that complicated. It's very simple. And so Kevin McCarthy, Speaker of the House, not Nancy Pelosi, Kevin McCarthy. We can investigate, and we will. That's, I do think we should do that. I actually think that's important. I know people, you know, people say, you know, at least investigate it, expose it. Saying in politics, sun, sunshine's the best disinfectant. So expose it, that alone oftentimes puts a stop to it. But for the, know, did that address your question? Go ahead. You, no, go ahead. not really. Uh, for, the, for the folks in Ottumwa, Iowa, or uh, just a random pick of, of, of a name, or Indianapolis, or wherever they are, and I know you don't mm -hmm. represent them, but the Republican Party does, Right. the investigations don't improve railways, they don't control inflation, they don't, you know, it's, they don't get rid of of the the uh what are the supply problems that right, we've had right. all of these the investigations i think are very satisfying from okay. a political level but at a practical level they don't do much and i fear that it just it it's it feels like firing salvos at each other right. and I see what you're saying. so okay. i kind of want to talk about more uh forward thinking and fixing okay. things well, uh, let me mention what we're doing this week. Uh, today and tomorrow we vote on House Resolution 1, our first bill. It's called the Lower Energy Cost Act. Okay, and, the, this, and this is going to encounter what we think Joe Biden, I would say Joe Biden has, has uh, been very unfriendly to oil and gas and coal throughout his history. Where this, the goal is to increase domestic energy production, reform the permitting process. You may recall a year ago when our Senator Joe Manchin voted for the so-called Inflation Act, uh, he claimed he would get a big old pipeline through West Virginia, and he never got his pipeline. So permitting reform is still a problem. Uh, oil and gas providers, energy providers have requested a lot of pipelines, and they're hitting roadblocks everywhere. So this bill will allow them to you know, make, make a better process to get the pipelines. 
so that's what we're going to vote on today. Um, it, you know, it does a lot of other things, streamlining energy infrastructure and exports, boosting the production and processing of critical minerals. Now, we have to get that bill through the House. I believe we'll pass it. Uh, we'll do amendments today. I think we're voting the bill tomorrow. The bill still has to get through the Senate. I can't promise what the Senate's going to do. It is a Democrat body, but maybe they'll agree with our bill and many, many, on, many things on our bill. So that's what we can do, deliver better energy costs. We, you know, and then I, I will say this, the spending I referenced in, in inflation issues is, is big for everybody, and it's not that hard to figure out when the government just spends trillions of extra dollars a year, you have increased inflation. So I would say controlling spending, uh, looking at every dollar of tax dollar that's spent is important as well. And even though it's divided government, and we, we do have a Democrat president, Democrat Senate, but a Republican House, so the voters have given us divided government, I still think we can control spending, which will get inflation under control. And one issue coming up every five years, we reauthorize the, uh, the, the Farm Bill. It's called the Farm Bill. And within that, there are basically food stamps, like uh, you know, food for, for, for people within the Farm Bill. And we don't, have, we don't have strict work requirements. So when you talk about supply chain, I think you just mentioned supply chain issues. Mm-hmm. In my view, one of, the, one of the issues with supply chain is a lot of people make as much money not working as working because they get you know, unemployment, welfare benefits, food benefits. So what we're pushing in the Farm Bill, and we're pushing it hard, I've co-sponsored legislation to do this, this year is to make sure that if you get uh, welfare benefits and you're an able-bodied adult with no dependent children, uh, that you actually have work requirements for that. I think that'll help with the supply chain issue. I think the supply chain issue is, has been a problem because a lot of folks aren't working. It's hard to find. Everywhere I travel in West Virginia, I do travel a lot in West Virginia, and I hear it everywhere, it's hard to find people who want to work. You probably hear that from, from places you go. You go. Right now, there's two open jobs for every unemployed person in the country. Matt there Miller. You go. Yeah. And I'm, I'm still boggled by the idea that there are that many jobs and yeah. people are able to go, eh, I just don't want to work. Right. So, yeah, it's amazing. We, and we've been able that through the laws down here. We see it in so many ways. Um, you know, we probably look at the disability. Uh, disability claims make sure that people on disability are actually disabled. A lot of very liberal judges give disability to anybody for any reason. There's no really check and balance on that. I've explored that during my time in Congress as well. So uh, it is, you know, it, it, it costs money, taxpayer dollars, and it also uh, causes problems, I think, in supply chain. You mentioned taxpayers' dollars. I'm going to push you just a little bit because you talked about inflation and obviously the spending that comes out of our nation's okay. capital. Um, Republicans talk about it. But yet when they get opportunities, they tend to spend just as much as Democrats do. At what point do we finally get to the understanding, you know what, doesn't matter which party you're in, we got to bring this under control? Well, it's a fair point. I wouldn't say they spend as much, but I, I would say both parties have allowed spending to go up. Uh, but under Democrats, however, just in the past two years under Biden, it's been like $5 trillion added to our debt. It is staggering the amount of money they spent. I think they took advantage of COVID to spend like crazy. And right now, actually, a lot of that money has not been spent. We, you can, we can re, there's talks about reclaiming some of the unspent COVID funds throughout the country uh, that, as one of the ways of balancing the budget. So, look, I, I'm in the Freedom Caucus, as you know, and we've been saying this the, the whole time. I've, I've frankly stopped voting for continuing resolutions that, that spend too much, and sometimes I'm one of only 40 people to do so because I feel we have to stand up to it. You're attacked viciously. If, if you vote to cut spending anywhere ever, like, for example, I voted for a 1% cut across the board, the entire government, 1% cut of everything, just 1%. It's almost symbolic just to make the point that it's possible to cut somewhere or something. Now, that, of course, politically opens me up to attacks and lies that, that you know, I'm cutting. They're going to say I'm cutting, you know, some, some good program. And, and that, and even, but even that amendment that's been on all the budgets, it's never passed you know, it gets, it doesn't even get all the Republicans. It doesn't get any Democrats. But we need to we need to, we do need to we do need to cut spending here and live within our means. We passed generally we work on a ten year program here for balancing the budgets. I was on the budget committee my first two years in Congress. I'm in my ninth year now. And I was and learned a lot being on that budget committee. The process if you follow it I think actually works. You pass the budget that balances and then you authorize what's legal and what's not legal to spend money on and then last but not least you appropriate, you write the checks. We've fallen away from that. We do these big spending bills that create massive debt. Um, look, frankly, frankly, the House, we have the votes to do it. If the Republicans all hang together, or, or when the Democrats were in control, you saw them, they hung together too, and they passed their bills out of the House. It does have to get through the Senate. The Senate has a filibuster, so that requires 60 votes. 
And if they don't get 60 votes to pass something, you have a government shutdown situation. So you have, you know, you, we have that battle, you know, potentially looming this year, because by September we have to fund the government again. And uh, there's a debt ceiling. There's a debt ceiling that's going to run out. So we have to pay our debts, which is growing bigger and bigger every year. It's, it's, it's a huge part of the problem. Um, it is a massive problem, and I think we need to talk about it more. Uh, there's a theory I hear from a lot of folks that the voters, when it comes time to vote, don't vote debt in the country. Um, but they're going to, I think, and it's something I think we can lead on as Republicans and even as Democrats. I think this is a, bi- this is a bipartisan problem. You know, as, as you just mentioned, both parties have been partial in causing it. Um, I have, frankly think the Democrats are a lot worse. A lot of them are basically socialists. They want the government to run everything. So I, I, I don't think it's the same. But I do think it's a problem for both parties. Let me come full circle to the beginning of our conversation, if you will. Um, After nine years uh, in Congress, why is now the time to make the move over to the Senate? So that's putting my political hat on right now as a candidate. If if you look at the whole country, the biggest anomaly politically is that conservative West Virginia, where Donald Trump got 70 percent of the vote twice, won every county. We now have a Republican registration advantage, pretty significant one, that we send a Democrat to the U.S. Senate, who I, I say votes for the Democrats. Every now and then he does something different, gets a lot of attention, but he's an enabler of the Joe Biden and the agenda, voted to impeach Donald Trump, for example. So I do think, I do believe Republicans would do a better job running this country, or I wouldn't be running at all, and I think the U.S. Senate should be Republican, and I think if I do, if, if the voters in this state are willing to put me in there, a conservative Republican, not a liberal Republican, not a rhino, if you want a conservative Republican representing West Virginia in the U.S. Senate, that's me. Uh, and, and I have a proven voting record now after nine years of that. Like I said, people are going to you know, probably try to distract from that. Um, but I, but I, I'm going to submit that to the voters. And, and, when, and uh, you know, if they give me the opportunity, represent them just the same way as a fighting conservative in the U.S. Senate. And help this, not just West Virginia, help all of America uh, with all the problems we just talked about and many others. Uh, you know, go, go back to our conservative traditional values and our roots. Alex, what is the status? This will be the final question. I know you've got to get going to, but what is the status of the ethics investigations on you right now at this moment? No updates. Have you been get? Have you gotten any word whatsoever as to whether they'll continue or Nothing. be dropped? Nothing at all. Nothing, because the, the the Democrat overrun one and no longer does anything with it. It's to the House committee now. That's actually a fair bipartisan committee. So, haven't heard anything. All right. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you kindly, sir. You're welcome. Have a great day.